going to look at the latter half of Ezekiel 37 uh, for um, our Bible class this evening, partly because it's quite an unusual subject. I must admit I'd not um, come across uh, any talks on uh, these uh, two sticks being rejoined uh, when I started looking at uh, as this as a study. So what we're going to do first of all is uh, have a little bit of an overview and we're also going to just ask ourselves where do we place these chapters, how do we place uh, these, these chapters, uh, chapters 36 to um, 39 uh, in terms of time. We're then going to look at uh, what I call the, uh, the broken sticks which is uh, from uh, Zechariah, where the talk of the, of the sticks being broken. Uh, and then we're going to look at, the, in detail, at the, the, the verses from 15 to the end of the chapter, where we have this description of these sticks being rejoined. And we're going to try and um, tease out the, the meaning of the different words. We've got Joseph in there, haven't we? We've got Ephraim in there. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Jacob in there. Obviously, we've got David, who is perhaps a bit more obvious who that one is. Uh, and then, uh, once we've looked at that, we'll perhaps just try and close with a little bit of exhortation. So, first of all, how do we fit these chapters together? The first time I gave this talk, um, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, well, it's all very interesting, but I, I don't really think you've got the, 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 the sequencing right um, in terms of uh, the chapters uh, 36 to, to 39. Surely we should be able to see these uh, these chapters uh, as something that is sequential. So we read chapter 35, then we read 36 and 37, 38, 39, uh, and they all follow on after each other. It's either mine or Stuart's. Fortunately, it's Stuart's. Um, so, so I went away and I thought, well, it's not something I'd really thought of, um, but uh, let's have a look at it. Uh, and see whether we ought to see this as a chronological order and therefore chapter 38, which is pretty famous and, and well known to us, would then follow after what we're looking at at chapter 37. Well, a little bit of looking at it soon reveals that you can't see these as something being sequential one after the other. If you go back to chapter 36 and verse 8, we're told there... For ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to be to my people Israel, to, to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. So, so there we've got a flourishing of the nation of Israel. And yet, uh, when we, we were looking at chapter 37, we've got this valley of dry bones. So that seems a little bit odd, doesn't it? And when we come to verse 25 of chapter 36... We've got there uh, a verse that tells us, I will, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So, so here, Israel has got a, a, a new heart. And yet again, in chapter 37, we've got this, these dry bones, and we've got descriptions of um, a, a nation that, uh, that is not at one with God. So chapter 37 we've read together. Notice how chapter 37 ends. We've got God's sanctuary established, verse 27 for, um, for connection. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their people, and they shall be my... I shall be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them, forevermore. So here at the end of chapter 37 we've got a picture of uh, the Lord God and the, and the nation of Israel harmonious together uh, and God's sanctuary is going to be there and it's going to be there forevermore. And yet if we just skip over chapter 38 we're going to come back to that in a moment. When we come to chapter 39 and verse 22 we're told these words. So shall the house of Israel know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. So chapter 39 can't be after, uh, in terms of time, after chapter 37. Because chapter 37 has got this reuniting of God's people with, with their God. Chapter 39 says, well, this from, from this day forward 
we're going to to be um, to be known to God, or God's going to be known to us. So we can't see chapter thirty six to thirty nine uh, as as something that's just chronological, just follows up one after the other. Now the other question I get asked by people is, well, yes, you can't see it all chronological, but but could you see chapter thirty eight? And the events of chapter 38 taking place after chapter 37. So the scenario is, well, Lord Jesus has come back to Israel and and Israel has accepted the Lord Jesus and they're living happily in the land, as it were. And then chapter 38 is a description of of a terrible host that comes against the nation. And the the hypothesis is that chapter 38 is is a saving of Israel, but, but nobody really gets hurt. Uh, people say, well, it's different in terms of its language to um, Zechariah 14, which talks very graphically about uh, um, the destruction of the nation. So, so could we see chapter 38 as, as some sort of attack by nations uh, uh, against the nation of Israel? But because the nation of Israel is in the land and the Lord Jesus is there, this attack is repelled and, and everything carries on um, happily for, for the nation of Israel. Now again, when we look at the, the actual detail of the chapter, we see that uh, that can't actually be the case. Although we don't have uh, language uh, like Zechariah 14 verse 2 where it talks about the, 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 the women being ravished and the, the, the houses destroyed, we do have a description of the nation that's coming against Israel coming like a storm. Verse 9, Now shall ascend and come like a storm and shall be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. So, so this can't be a description of an army that sort of comes to the, to the borders of the land and it, it is immediately repelled because the language there is saying it's going to cover the land like a cloud. Now, I don't know whether any of you have gone out walking and all of a sudden the fog comes in and the mist descends and, and you're covered in a cloud. But it's everywhere, isn't it? It's all, all around. So if this army is going to come and cover the land like a cloud, it's got to be all over the land. It's got to be everywhere within the land. And verse 19 and 20 <coughs> of chapter 38 talk about the, the physical destruction of the, the nation or the land in the nation. Verse 19, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be cut thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground now in chapter 37 we've had a description of the, of the sanctuary being built and, and that being there forevermore if, if this, these, these, this army has come and covered the land like a cloud and God says I'm going to shake everything every wall is going to be shaken and fall I think that's a description of great destruction that's taking place in the land of Israel. But let's just go on to chapter 39, where we have a verse that I think categorically describes to us, or or confirms to us, that uh, chapters 38 and 39 must take place before the events that we're going to look at in chapter 37. Come with me to verse 26 of Ezekiel 39. (coughs) Let's just go into um, verse 25 for connection. Therefore saith the Lord God, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, so restore uh, the people back to the land, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel. Now that's a a little phrase that we perhaps want to take note of because we're going to come across that a, a little bit earlier in chapter 37. So I'll have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. And... After that, they have borne their shame. This is describing what what Israel has gone through. They've borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me, 
when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid now that word dwell safely in their land is the same word that we have in Ezekiel 38 and verse 11 where it says and thou shalt say I will go up to the land of unwalled villages I will go to them that are at rest and they dwell swiftly all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gate it's that dwelling safely it's the same Hebrew word here in chapter 39 we are told that the reason that this army comes against the nation of Israel and, and looks at them that are dwelling safely is because in that time they didn't put their trust in God and so therefore God describes it as a trespass against him. So the, the destruction that we have in chapter 38 and 39 are because of Israel's trespass. Therefore, in chapter 37 where we have the description of the, the reuniting of the, the broken sticks together and the reuniting of God and his people cannot be and before chapter 39. So let's now start thinking about uh, this chapter 37 that uh, we're looking at this evening. Before that, we need to, to set the scene. And I want to uh, go through what I've called the, the fractures of Israel. Because step by step, Israel became further and further from God. So if we go back to the very beginning, we have Jacob and we have his 12 sons. Now, I don't know whether the 12 sons ever really did dwell harmoniously with Jacob because um, they were a bit of a, a rum boat brunch to, from the very start, weren't they? But, but at least they were a family, weren't they? They, they, they were together as a family, uh, the father and his 12 sons. But of course, that doesn't last for very long, does it? Because... Joseph is sold into slavery. And so the family is, is separated. It's now no longer one family. It's a family and a son that is uh, separated and in slavery in Egypt. So, so the family unit has, has fractured. Now, if we go forward uh, quite a long time to the Exodus, we have another fracturing of the family unit. Because at Joseph's, uh, or at uh, Jacob's death, we have the inheritance that's passed on to the 12 sons. But if you remember, Joseph doesn't receive the inheritance like the other sons, does he? he, he his inheritance goes to his two sons. So, so, so there's, a, there's a difference there. But when we come to the Exodus, we have a, a, a greater difference because Levi doesn't have their inheritance either, does it? Do they? Because of their faithfulness, they are appointed as priests. So they don't have their inheritance in the land either. They are a kingdom of priests instead, and they don't um, have the, the allotments of the land like the, the other tribes. So there is again a fracturing of the family. There now has to be a certain tribe that, that is the intercessor between God and his people. Let me go forward to David and Solomon. But after Solomon, the nation fractures even further, doesn't it? It becomes two separate nations, but they're dwelling in the same land. And that continues for a time, as we know. Eventually, the northern kingdom is taken out of the land. And so therefore, you've got two separate people of Israel is a word Judah that is still in the land and you've got Israel that has been taken out of the land and they never return again do they they are what we call the lost ten tribes and they've gone and they've uh, they've disappeared in the eyes of history and eventually Judah gets taken out of their land they get to Babylon they do come back again but eventually they get taken out of the land as well and then we have uh, since AD 70 until the, the present day a situation where there has been the Jews the, 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 the tribe of Judah and, and those tribes that are, that are with them with no land 
So they are wanderers in the earth with, with no land of Israel. Now you might wonder why I've given you that little potted history of the nation of Israel. The reason why is because Ezekiel 37 is to do with the step-by-step -step mending of those fractures that we've looked at. But before we, we look at that mending, come with me to Zechariah chapter 11. Now Zechariah 11 is, is slightly different, but it, it uses uh, the same sort of language in terms of there being sticks that are broken. So in Zechariah chapter 11, we have in verse 7 two staves, one called beauty uh, and one called bands. Now we know that part of this prophecy is related to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're told in verse 10, I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant that I had made with all the people. And it was broken in the day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And then we have a description of, that is used of uh, the betrayal of Judas or by Judas of the Lord Jesus, don't we, in verse 12, uh, so they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. But let's just go down to verse 14. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So these breaking of these two bands does two things. It breaks the brotherhood of Judah and Israel, but it also, God says, breaks his covenant. So if we see uh, the breaking of the band or the stave as a breaking of the covenant, I think we can see when we come to chapter 37 of Ezekiel and these, these sticks are rejoined back together, we have a, a renewing of the covenant that God makes with his people Israel. We have the drawing back in to the fold of the nation of Israel. Now, just one other thing that I want us to notice from Zechariah um, 14. It talks about Israel and Judah. And when we talk about Israel and Judah, I think it's, it's meaning that the whole house of Israel, all of Israel, uh, together. So let's go to chapter 37. Now, we know the first half of chapter 37 very well, don't we? The, the, the Valley of Dry Bones, with its graphic representation of bones that are brought together uh, as a skeleton uh, that, has, that has no life in it and it gets its, its skin, uh, and, but it's still got no life in it and eventually there's breath and they stand up and they're a very great army. And we talk about it in relation to the nation of Israel and talk about it being fulfilled when the, the nation of Israel came back into existence in 1948. Now, I think that is, that is true, but I think it is only a partial fulfilment of the first half of Ezekiel 37. In fact, I think it's the smaller part of the fulfilment of Ezekiel 37. I think the future uh, restoration of Israel is, is the greater fulfilment of the first half of Ezekiel 37. So when we come to the, the second half of the, uh, the chapter, we have here in more detail a description of the greater regathering of the nation of Israel after the Gogian invasion. Remember when we looked at chapter 38, when we looked at chapter 38, we, we see that the people are scattered out of the land. So as the Gogian invasion comes... And it takes the people, or the nation of Israel, and takes them out of the land. So they're scattered once more. So we go back to, to a situation uh, like, such as it was before 1948, of Israel not being in their land. Come with me to Isaiah and chapter 11.
Verse 10, just for connection. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So, no, that, 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 it, that is indicative of the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which he left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Kush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. So, so he's talking about a second time bringing back the, the people of Israel back into their land. Now just come with me to chapter 66. We have quite a long description in, in chapter 66 of this process. Verse 14. And when you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bones shall flourish. So, uh, similar language to, to Ezekiel 37, haven't we? We've got those dry bones and they're going to come back to life. So, I shall flourish as an herb and the hand of the Lord shall be known towards his servants and his indignation towards his enemies. And behold, the Lord will come with fire and with chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the fire and by his for by fire and by his sword shall the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So by warfare uh, these people are brought back. They that sanctify themselves and purify well we'll just actually we'll just skip verse seventeen. Let's just come back down to verse nineteen. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, to Pull, and to Lud that draw the bow, to Tubal and to Jabin, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my name, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and chariots. So what it's saying is, is those Jews that survive the, 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 the invasion of Israel, the Gogin invasion, will have a job to do, to go out and to bring back their brethren into the land of Israel. And it talks about them, them worshipping God and uh, being priests um, for, for the Lord God. So, so there's clear references in the scripture to this second regathering, not um, the, the gathering of the nation of Israel into the land that has taken place now, but a future gathering. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 16. This is quite interesting because we know, if we think of people like Rahab, how famous um, the exploits of the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt were. But here we're told, in verse 14, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. Now that isn't the sort of thing that is said today, is it? People don't say the Lord lives because he brought the nation of Israel um, back into the land from the north, from the nations of the north. We might use it as, as, as an evidence for um, the existence of God, that, that he prophesied he would bring his people back, and he did. But that's not the, the sort of general consensus in the world, is it? That, uh, that Israel is uh, God's people and, and God lives because of the nation of Israel. Come with me to Jeremiah 31, just for a, a final reference on this. So Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel 
and with the house of Judah. So we're sort of coming back to our, the territory of our Ezekiel 37 uh, concepts. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out of the, by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, though I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. In other words, those two groups united together. And he says, After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and <coughs> they will be my people. So the essence of Ezekiel chapter 37 is the description of how that those two parties that are described there as Israel and Judah come into that, that single party, the whole house of Israel. So let's look now at detail at this, um, this section of uh, Ezekiel 37 from verse 15 onwards. Let's just familiarise familiarize ourselves with some of the phrases that we're going to, to come across. Verse 15 talks about, uh, well, verse 16, be, Son of man, take one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. And on the other stick, write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So we've got two sticks. One stick is for Judah and for the children of Israel. It's drawing our attention to, to, to the tribe of Judah. But it's saying, oh, but there's also uh, the, the, the children of Israel as well. I think what the scriptures is trying to do is say, I'm using Judah a, as, a, as a symbol. But it's not just the tribe of Judah that I'm talking about. I'm talking about all of Israel, but they're symbolised by Judah. So where it talks about the house of um, Israel or the children of Israel, I think it's talking about Israel in, in general. So what we want to pick up on is what's being meant by Judah. And then the other stick, we're told, write upon it for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So there's another group of Israelites which come from all the different sort of tribes of Israel, but, but they're going to be represented by Ephraim and by Joseph. So, so the two sticks, we could say one is represented by Judah and the other is represented by Ju Joseph and Ephraim. So, so what can we see being represented by those two characters? Well, Judah... <coughs> when we've had the division of the nation of Israel, ten tribes were, were Israel, weren't they? And the, and the remaining more faithful ones were called Judah. But I think the thing we want to, to focus on here is what happened to Judah. Judah was in the land, wasn't it? And then it was taken out of the land. Some remained in the land. The poor remained in the land. But, but many were taken into captivity and then they came back again. So Judah represents those Jews that are in the land of Israel now. Some will stay in the land after the, the invasion. Others will be taken and go into captivity, but will come back again from that captivity, just as the exiles did um, in, in ancient times. So Judah represents those that, 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 that we might term as Israel now. What of Joseph and what of the house of Ephraim? Well, if you think about Ephraim, Ephraim was, was a Jew, wasn't he? He was Jewish, he was the son of Joseph, and he had the promises made to him. He had an inheritance. But apart from the fact that he might have gone back for Jacob's burial... He never stepped foot in the land of Israel. He went, we might say, on holiday there to bury his grandfather. But other than that, he never lived in the land of, Egypt, of Israel. He, was in, he lived in Egypt. So Ephraim represents those Jews that are not in the land. 
those that are dispersed around the world. And so the, break, the bringing back of the two sticks is to do with, with the bringing back of those Jews that are in the land and those Jews that are outside the land. You see, the kingdom requires all Jews to be brought back into the land of Israel. And so we have passages that describe, we looked briefly at uh, Isaiah, didn't we? But it has passages that describe going and bringing back, seeking out those Jews that are not living in the land. And they've got to be brought in to the land. So these two sticks can be healed. The other thing that's interesting to note about Joseph is Joseph was someone who was sold into slavery, wasn't he? So maybe Joseph is representative of those that, that perhaps were in the land, or are in the land now, and, and, are, and are sold into slavery, and then have to be brought back. God wants us to, to have an idea who these people are, but he also wants us to understand what's going to happen in that they're going to be joined. They were two sticks, they become joined into one stick. Now I don't know, I'm sure you've all broken sticks uh, in times past. If you break a twit stick, if you, if, you, if you snap it, it's very hard to put it back together again, isn't it? Now sometimes you break things, don't you? When you're young, you break something and you think, oh no, I reckon if I just put it back really carefully, nobody will notice. But generally speaking, it's pretty difficult to do. Um, even from a visual point of view, uh, it doesn't look right. And certainly if you go and try and test it, it's still broken, isn't it? It doesn't really join, even though you might be able to sort of push them together so they look like they join. So it's very difficult to take something that's been broken and join it back together. But God is able to do what's impossible with us. So he is able to join these people back together. And in the second part of um, this section that we're looking at, we have a step-by-step -step reversal of all of those things that we looked at when we looked at the fracturing of Israel. So we're told in verse 21... Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. So, so the process is begun with, with the people being brought in. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. So that's what we're going to end up with. We're going to end up with one nation in the land and notice how the land is described it's not the land with the borders that we have now because the mountains of Israel is what we would call um, the, the West Bank so they're going to have the whole nation of Israel the, the land that was promised to Abraham not the chunk of it that they've got now so they're going to have the whole land they're going to be one people and one king shall be king to them all and there shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. So do you remember they were two nations? There was a nation that was in the land when Judah was in the land, and there was a nation that was out of the land, which was the nation that was carried away captive by the Assyrians. But that's not going to be the case anymore. In fact, it's not going to be e e even as it was after the days of Solomon, when there were, what does it say, two kingdoms. So there's not going to be a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, two fractured peoples but living in the same land. That's not going to be the case either. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols. Well, if there was one thing that, uh, that marked out Israel right from the very beginning, uh, it was their problems with idols. Uh, nor with their transgressions but I will save them out of all their dwelling places when they have sinned and I will cleanse them so shall they be my people and I will be their God 
and David, my servant, shall be king over them. So now, if we're going backwards in history, as it were, re-mending all the fractures, now we've gone to the, to the kingdom of David, when the kingdom was at its zenith. But of course, David was representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the beloved king, uh, the one that was going to sit, or one that shall sit on David's throne, even the Lord Jesus Christ. So David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. Now we could go back to Zechariah, but we haven't got time to think about the, the, the shepherds there. There's one shepherd, one spiritual guide. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes to do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant. So now we've gone back in history, as it were, from David and the kingdom under David. And we've gone back and we've undone the, the, the problem with the Levites. And we've undone the problem of Joseph being uh, sold into slavery. And we've gone all the way back to the beginning, as it were, when we didn't have all those fractures. When we had Jacob in the land with all his family. And so all those thousands of years of, of fracturing and breaking and moving further and further away from the things of God have now been undone. And they're one nation in the land and to Jake, with Jacob there under the Lord Jesus Christ. And now having all that work of, 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 of repairing all of those fractures, now they're going to dwell therein forever. So we're told, we're in, my, in the middle of verse 25, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant. This is one of the great, most significant covenants that God can make with a people. A covenant of peace and an everlasting covenant. And we go back all the way to, to Genesis and, and to Abraham and, and uh, Noah to see the, these things being foreshadowed. So we're going back in time, really, and we're getting closer I would say to Eden, the restoration of Eden, which is, which is the whole purpose of God, has been to get us back to the start, where it was very good. So here's a people in peace with an everlasting covenant, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Echoes of the tabernacle, echoes of the temple, Echoes of the Garden of Eden now, because it was God that came into the Garden of Eden, of Eden to, to be with Adam and Eve. And that was the whole purpose of God at the beginning, that he would have a people that he would dwell with and have fellowship with. And now we've got all the way back almost to that. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. But it's not quite at Eden yet, is it? There's a work still to be done. There's a witness. There's the original purpose of the nation of Israel. Do you remember when God said, I'm going to take you into a land? What was the point of them going into a land? That the people round about might see you and see your ways and understand that you're different and understand me, said God by you and your ways and so we're now at that witnessing stage aren't they, that the heathen shall know that I the Lord do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore so all of the undoing has been undone as it were all of those fractures have been healed and the kingdom is established and the nations understand about God and his ways. We're just behind on a slide but let's just go to our final slide because 
I want us to finish by a word of exhortation. In our lives here, in our lives, in the lives of the brethren and sisters throughout all ages, all of the faithful have realised that their lives are completely unworthy of the high calling that they've been called to. We look at our lives and we think, well, even on our good days, we don't make a very good job of being disciples of the Lord God. And we look at Israel, don't we? And sometimes we say, oh, what a terrible lot they were. Fancy moaning about having manna after a few years, of having the same food day after day. And sometimes in our honest moments, we say to ourselves, would it be any different? Well, maybe a little different, but perhaps not that different. You see, we're fractured from God, aren't we? And we create our own fractures. You know, Christadelphians have, have not got a, a lot to be happy about when it comes to harmony together. And yet, the God that is able to fra heal the fractures of Israel is also able to deal with our fractures, to bind up our broken hearts, to be with us when we realise that we are unworthy followers of him. And so the God that is able to do all that for Israel is also, brethren and sisters, able to do it for us as well. What a wonderful hope and thought that is, brethren and sisters.